Hey, everybody. this is Tina from Quantum Healing with Tina. And today we're going to talk to Karen about her second BQH session. And you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. <laughs> hello, four people that liked our video. <laughs> That's cool. Wait, there's two of us. <laughs> yeah, there's two. Um, so in your your second session was I don't even know how to describe it because it was it was crazy for me on my end. Like you were just you were, you know, under and going with it. But on my end, so in the beginning of the session, the first being you had landed on cobblestone like it felt you said it felt like the 1800s you were a man um alone on the streets in the dark and you said you were feeling very heavy and you couldn't really see anything that was going on around you so we took a little walk you went into a bar um i had already checked out by then right at the cobblestone because i was like all right see ya <laughs> <laughs> Right. And for me, I'm like, okay, so we're alone in the dark on the cobblestone and nothing's happening, <laughs> you know, so, so we took a little walk and you ended up in the bar and then you started to say that you felt sad and you were feeling very heavy and like you had lost someone. And, um, we came to find out that you were, you were a male in that life and you had lost your uh, wife and son. So from that scene, we went back to before you lost them and we explored that a little bit. So you landed in front of your home. Do you remember? Do you have the visuals from that? All I have in my mind is the, um, the front porch with the two or three, like the two uh, rocking chairs or something. Yeah. And then what it was a, a black and white scene, and the only thing that was in color was the American flag. Wow. So I was like, oh, I'm American. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because before, when we were on the street, you said you felt like it was Europe somewhere. But then when we got into the front of your house, you had an American flag. Right. And rocking chairs. And your wife came out and called you for dinner. And I said, oh, well, are you going to go, you know, eat dinner? And you said, well, when the when the wife calls, you got to come. <laughs> so you went in and you explored and you saw your wife and you had a little boy who I think was about three. <laughs> and it was just kind of that scene of eating dinner and you all just gathered around and feeling that love from them. Do you remember that at all? <laughs> No. no. Um, and when you looked at your, when your wife looked at you, you said you, um, you're like, I don't know why, but when my wife looks at me, I look down. And you said, we're always together because you work there. It was a farm. There were wheat fields and I think some cattle. Okay. Um, and then after that scene, we moved again to find out what had happened to them. And we found out that your son was sick with scarlet fever and um, he got really, really ill. And your wife also did too around the same time. And this son had died and the wife um, also had died a couple of weeks later. Um, and you had begged her to try harder, but she just didn't want to. She was tired and just wanted to transition and go home. So then you and that life were left with the survivor's guilt of feeling like, why did this happen to them and not me? Right? right. And that... Um, <clears throat> So we went to your last day, you were in the same house, but there was a different owner because you had sold, you had sold the land to a young person um, so that they could work the land as long as you could keep the house you were in. Um, and so you transitioned over in your 80s 
and um, you were on the sitting in your wife's rocking chair on the front porch as you transitioned over and your big um, lesson from that life was the guilt that you carry mm -hmm. and we find out later what that scene was all about right right do you remember <laughs> i'm like yeah of course i do <laughs> So in the beginning, when this, as this scene was going on, a fly came into the room, like right at the beginning of the session. And this was not like any other fly I had ever heard before. The thing must have been huge, right? It's spinning around in the light, in the lampshade. And it's so, so loud that it was, it was really distracting to me. And I'm thinking that you could probably hear it because it was so loud. So I'm like, oh my God, what, what is this thing doing? Why is this thing here? Like right now, it, it mm -hmm. was like literally as soon as you landed in that life, the fly came into the room. I was gone at cobblestone because I didn't want to deal. <laughs> <laughs> you were just checked out. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, I'm not staying. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I get glimpses, like, as you're saying it, like, little, sometimes they're pictures, sometimes they're actual image, uh, not images, but, like, live, as if I'm there, but very brief, you know, mm -hmm. like a, like a live video, mm -hmm. or a live picture, rather, and um, this one, like, it, it, it seems all black and white to me, I don't know, I mean, yeah, I see myself sitting on the rocking chair, I remember the last day where I died on that rocking chair. But it was always the same scene, like nothing, it just seemed very mundane. Very yeah. Gray, like no color anymore in this guy's life. But that's mm -hmm. why when I saw it, the only thing that was really bright was the American flag, I did, just, just to get my attention. But apart from that, it was always just gray. I didn't feel good about himself. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Like, he was really... He was really sad after he lost his wife and kid. Right. How do you and feel in that? Were you like, okay? <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's the kind of life Dolores kind of would call a digging potatoes kind of life. It's just a normal, everyday life that digging people potatoes. have. Yeah. But I was surprised because in our previous session, you had gone to the stars. Right? So that's why I checked out at the cobblestone. I was like, I don't know. You're like, where am I? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was surprised because um, it didn't really fit. But we f find out later why that was. But anyway, so this fly, I was just hoping that it would go away somehow. And eventually it did. It stopped buzzing. I couldn't hear it anymore. And then we progressed from that life and when we moved, we moved into your current life, to your childhood and you were in your house. Do you have those memories of exploring the house? I Talk about there. that. Yes, I was there. We landed, I remember, we landed in 1986. It was, I saw the big, you know, like in Mindhunter, how it has like the big name that just pops up. Yeah, that was like 1986, right in my face. But I felt it too. And I was outside again. Our house was small at the time because uh, we didn't do the renovations to like make it the biggest house on the block at that point. But yeah, we had a small house just like everybody else. And then our next door neighbor was outside and she was wearing that outfit, that yellow, like, you know, uh, was Terry that? cloth. Yeah, Terry cloth, like one piece type you know you know watering her grass and I was like a three-year-old kid just running around you know the front lawn and I remember it being a Sunday I didn't want to go inside because once I was inside I couldn't go out anymore and mm -hmm. I was already like Sundays was a really bad day because I knew everybody was going to go back to work and I had to continue you know being indoors with my grandma probably watching soap operas again you know <laughs> And I really wanted to be outside. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went inside the house. And 
Oh my god, I just like remember everything. The the feel of the carpet, the colors of the carpets, the the wallpaper, the flowery like seventies wallpaper, like with the flowers and the yeah, that um yeah, the carpet, the brown, like caca brown carpet. Mm. And yeah, everything was just it was so retro. They even had like the they have like saloon doors at the you know like going into the kitchen. Yeah, we had that. Um, I remember the couches, the way that they looked or where they were placed. Anyway, so yeah, I was just like in awe, like with everything, like coming back to those memories because I don't, I don't really remember very much of the childhood, but being there, I saw everything for the detail. Well, in 1986, you were three. So being able to go back to that time when you were three years old and remember it in that vivid detail where you can right. feel it and smell it and yeah. see it so close up, like yes. you were actually in the house again. Yes, I was in it again. <clears throat> so you went around and you, you saw your grandmother making dinner in the kitchen and your mom was playing piano. Yeah, and you got, nice. And you got to sit under the piano again right with your mom yeah i would always like usually like sit there and then have my again ear to the uh to the piano because every time she would play the vibrations i love the vibration the feel of it and then being able to like you know if i were to close my eyes i could see the music the colors of the music the notes so yeah that was really nice to just sit there and be back there because i mean i haven't done that in a long time I don't even remember like the last time my mom played the piano in the house like for that long you know she used to play a lot but yeah we still have the same piano at the house but really it's just the kids now that just like yeah yeah and your dad and your grandfather were working on the lawnmower in the garage or something and uh your sister was also that lawnmower too like it was the lawnmower that we had at the time the red one and (laughs) With the yellow like gas cap like I remember the details like mm-hmm. and your sister was upstairs watching tv and then you I think you went down in the basement and were exploring down there yeah the couch and what, the couch that I jumped on and I and then I put I put it together that I was exactly like my son buggy buggies just jump in like I had that I felt that energy or me like standing on the edge of the couch and just you know what kids Mm -hmm. do jump and do whatever the hell they want doing flips and somersaults or whatever when you're not supposed to do that you know climbing behind the couch to go over and flip you know yeah I would do that all the time and I was like oh my god and so you saw yourself you saw yourself doing that and then you made the connection like oh my god that's my son Right. And I'm the one now who always like will tell him, like, can you stop doing that? Like, stop. But duh, it happened to me too. Yeah. Exactly. We were the same personality, like the same, like right. When when we went back to my to my older sister's bedroom, you know, I was notorious for for messing up her room all the time with the toys. Like I put them everywhere on the carpet, made sure that the carpet was completely covered. So I couldn't see any more of the red carpet, you know, just covered everything. She would be, she had OCD already at that point, you know, we're four years apart. So she already like always had her stuff very like in order. And then I just came in there like Tasmanian devil and just like. Oh yeah. And you were very. I was just like, let's do this. (laughs) You were very very pleased with yourself too. Like you, Yes, I could feel it. Like, I was just like, yes, let's do this. Like, I remember this feeling. Like, I want to cover the whole floor. Like, a puzzle, but we're going to cover the whole floor. With everything you have in this bedroom, we're going to cover it. Like, I was so on a mission to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you had really stepped into that childlike energy. Even your your voice changed. Like, you were, like, giggling. Like, you were really... Really, like, pleased with yourself that you were going to mess up your sister's room and she was going to hate it. And, and I but loved I, that she was going to hate it. <laughs> right. And you loved that she was going to hate it. And you later, you made the connection, like, oh, my God, like, this is what my kids do now. And I hate it because they're triggering me because they're me. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah. So that was really cool to see. But yeah, you saw how like hardcore I was where I was just like, oh yeah, I shit on the floor. And I had <laughs> like, no problem. <laughs> well, why'd you do that for? Because I could, you know, like it was really like, I didn't care. Right. I don't know what that means. Like either I was just like a, such a carefree whatever, or I was like a sociopath. I don't know. Like <laughs> I didn't care, you know. I just thought it was so fun. Like who cares, you know? Right. <laughs> exactly. That's the moral of the whole story. Who cares? Right. Who yeah. cares? Yeah. So then, um, so then you went. You went into a closet or something, and. We're talking to Joe Mikey again, your imaginary friend. Yeah, he was there. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Tell us about Joe Mikey. Joe Mikey was uh, someone who I found in the closet. I always have like a theme with the closets. I always in a closet, <laughs> hiding in the closet, crying in the closet silently. But yeah, I found Joe Mikey. He was in my sister's closet. I remember I would hide there. Or feel safe. I always felt safe in like confined spaces, like where I guess I could, you know, imagine or, you know, be by myself. You made them your log cabins, which you talk about in your first. Yes. I still do things like that now, like visualization about where I feel the safest. And sometimes I'll think of like a log cabin. I don't know why that's my thing, but like I always think of something like very cold. And then having a log cabin, let's say it's really nice and warm where you feel cozy and safe. And I could sleep better knowing that, putting myself in that position of feeling safe, you know. So, yeah, my my closet space was like my safe haven. So, yeah, my little log cabin. And that's where Joe Mikey was, my imaginary friend who looked like Shaggy from (laughs) Scooby-Doo. I really like him. He was a cartoon. He mm-hmm. looked like a cartoon. Yeah. I used to search him, like, I guess when internet finally, like, came out, like, and I actually realized, like, how to use it. I would actually go on the search engines at the time. Uh, they don't exist anymore. But I would search, like, uh, you know, Joe Mikey and the city that I lived in and death or something just to see, was he, like, an earthbound soul that, you know, was just hanging out at the house and I saw him or, like, I was trying to look for him but never found him. So I was just but, like, okay, no, you're just crazy. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, but we found out he was, what? Yeah. He was sent to me from my Syrian family or my guides just to kind of be a companion of mine or to, I don't know, like I, I just felt safe with him. So, you know, like I, I found that recognition when I when I found him there and I didn't feel like it was malicious or anything or I just felt really safe with him. So I could, I don't know. He was just my friend. I think my family thought it was just odd. I mean, came up with a name like Joe Mikey. It's so ordinary, but yeah. Yeah. Well, they said your guide said he was pure light. He was pure light and they sent him just to keep you company when you would go into the closet. (laughs) (laughs) So then we went upstairs and you were in, you went into the room where your sister Carly was watching TV. And at this point, I took a bathroom break. And as I was coming back in the room, the humongous fly, I swear it was this big. No, it was really, it was big though. It was sitting right on the floor. And I'm like, oh my God, like I never kill bugs. I always take them outside. But this fly, so... I'm like, all right, you know, it's a desperate situation. It calls for a desperate measure. So I pull out a shoe from the closet, and I asked you, as I raised it in the air, I'm like, what's your sister watching on TV? And you were like. I had, I didn't have, like, I was trying to look at the TV when you were talking to me. No, I said, is she watching a never-ending story? And you oh, said yeah. no. Yeah, I was like, no, because, like, for me, when you were talking to me, I was looking at the TV, because I'm like, what is she watching? Like, I was trying to see what she was watching. I couldn't see anything specifically or anything, but the only thing, it was just like a whoosh of of energy or, a, you know, like your intuition or whatever, that inner voice was just like, the fly. She's watching the fly. 
as you were well <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know that you were doing like, this but as that was happening you're like what is she watching I was like no she's watching the fly yeah that was, and I was like, oh my God, I was just about to kill a fly. <laughs> I right. couldn't believe it. I was like, it's the most, it's the biggest fly I've ever seen. And you're like, no, don't kill it. It's my grandfather. And I'm like, really? I have to like go get the cup now and get this fly in the cup and take it outside. Right. So that's what I did. So I'm still like engaged with you, asking you questions. You don't even really know what's going on on my end. So as I take the fly out to the door, thank God I, I, I did the session on my cell phone because I was going to use the laptop. And if I would have used the laptop, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So as I'm walking, I walk and open the door, I smell mulch burning. And I'm like, oh my God, what now? There's a fire? <laughs> and I look into the bushes and there's smoke coming up from the bushes. Like it's just smoldering and I can tell it's pretty big. So I'm like, oh my God. So I let the fly go. I have you in my pocket, <laughs> like the phone in my pocket. And I'm right. still talking to you and like asking you questions. And, and then I'm like, oh my God, I have to put out this fire. So I'm like, you know, come to the kitchen. I fill up the big you know, pitcher with water and I'm walking back and forth, putting out the fire. It was literally took a half hour. It wouldn't go out. It just was kept smoking and smoking and smoking. And I was like, wow. And I knew like, as it was happening, that the fly actually saved us from a humongous fire that could have happened, you know, so, so the whole the intervention, put it on the TV. <laughs> No, whatever. Um, no, like divine intervention, like put the fly on the TV screen for me to be like, oh yeah, now she's watching that. You know, all the synchronistic things that were just happening one after the other. Right. right. That was amazing. Just that part alone was amazing. That if I wouldn't have said anything, you know, about that fly, you would have never told me to take it outside. You know, you would have never said like, that's my grandfather. And I, I probably say that so. Yeah, but I probably would have killed it without saying anything, you know? Right. If I hadn't asked you at that exact moment what your sister was watching. I know you're like, well, what are you what are you watching? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was all so so perfect. Like it couldn't have been any more perfect. So then um, yeah, so I'm putting out the fire for that 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're exploring your your childhood home, which I was really grateful that you were there, and you know where I really didn't have to think that much because you're you've are you know it's somewhere you're familiar with. You're just in your childhood home exploring, and I'm kind of just like letting you go about and do what you want to see to see in the house and whatever. Well, so I didn't have to be the village. Yeah, so I didn't really have to think you know too much. I was grateful and. So that it just all happened so perfectly. It was crazy. So then after the fire was finally out and I sat back down mm. and I'm like, okay, so we're like wrapping up your childhood home exploration. And I'm like, okay, so what are we going to do now? Because if we go to the end of your life, you'll probably just transition back to Sirius, which we've already been to and explored. So let's see what happens if we go backwards through the womb. So I'm like, let's try that. And I, I have the script in front of me, but I realized I've never really done that before. So I wasn't fully prepared. And as, um, you know, going through the script, I get to the end where you're supposed to, you know, answer me and tell me what you're seeing and you're not there. <laughs> you're gone. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, what happened? And I look and my phone's completely dead because it had overheated right. from being in my, in my pocket that whole time. <clears throat> right. So I run to the freezer and I throw <laughs> the phone in the freezer and I'm like, oh my God, like Karen's in hypnosis. I don't know where she's at. Like, if she <laughs> If she like heard me, you know, if you had heard the whole regression and now you're somewhere all by yourself, like 
Who knows? I remember, actually, when you messaged me, like, saying, like, I'll be right there. I guess when your phone, I didn't even realize that you were gone. I think at one point I was like, hello? <laughs> like, but then I was like, oh, I think she's gone. Whatever, she'll call me back. And so I was just still going around, you know, build, you know, going through the house and just looking at stuff. Well, that was the other amazing thing about that. When that when the phone died, you didn't hear any of my regression through the room. So you were still in your house when I came back, which was amazing. And you were 16 years old. And when I, that's that's right. When we had ended that um, the first time, you were 16 oh, years old. Your friends were coming over with alcohol. But nothing important seemed to be happening in the scene. So we were going to go backwards. But when I came back and asked you again if there was anything important in the scene, you said that, yes, that's when you realized that the entity started attaching to you every time you drank with that specific friend. Mm -hmm. So even the phone dying had a purpose. And that purpose was to have you stay there longer and figure out that part of it that you didn't have when, um, like before we started the regression again. And yeah, so, so that's what we did. So we came back, we found that out and then, um, and then we, we did the regression and I was more prepared because I had time to look over the script while the phone was cooling off in the freezer. <laughs> Doing your homework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so what was really beautiful though is when um, I could see you on the video when you were regressing back through your mother's womb and feeling that. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Vaguely? Vaguely. Yeah. Well, that was really beautiful because I saw you get emotional. Um, so then after we went through the womb to when you were making the decision to come. I was emotional we, in the womb? Yeah. I'll see dark space. There's a theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dark space. Yeah. Because you felt um, you could you could hear your mom's heartbeat and feel that vibration and that vibration you felt was the closest thing to Sirius. Oh, wow. Yeah, true. Yeah. So we get to back to Sirius. We land in Sirius again and your parents are, you're the bird being again <laughs> and your parents are excitedly fixing your hair. We talked about me being a bird in the last video. We did it? I don't think so. Oh, I don't even wow. recall. Well, no, I was a bird. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you were a big blue bird. and Right. Oh, I think, or did we? No, no we, didn't. we didn't. It was the other video. <laughs> we lost. Yeah, that's where we talked about me being a bird. Yeah, I was a bird. That yeah. was shocking. I wasn't expecting that. Right. To, to be revealed to me that I was a blue bird. With very fine feathers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I had like feet like Big Bird. <laughs> you know, like the big feet and uh yeah, I have four toes. I only saw three, but I was I was seeing four in my head, in my mind, you know, four. You have four. But I was physically looking down at my feet and there was only three until I turned around and I saw the the one <laughs> toe pointing sat like the back. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, four. Yeah. But I didn't even know that birds had that. Till you yeah. said it, I was like, oh, really? I was like, okay. Well, it makes sense. Like, yeah, so you that's have also validating, <laughs> too. Like, I mean, in, in terms of imagination or whatever, like when you see things, you not doubt what you see because it can actually be real. Like, because you validated that for me. And I was like, oh, shoot, it is real. Right. Yeah. Because you didn't know that birds had that toe on the back. So, like, grasp on, like, even we have, our thumb is like that toe. Now it would grasp onto the tree trunk. Right. 
our branch. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so you were a bird and your parents were birds and your mom was blue and she had red, a little bit of red on her wing or arm. Mm -hmm. And your dad had green or yellow. Mm -hmm. And um, we found out later that your human, I think that was in the last session, your human aura has, is blue like indigo. And you carry the red, a little bit of red for your mom and a little bit of green for your dad, right? Yeah. Is it just the red I for your mom? Or it's just the red, yeah. Yeah. And all the red. Yeah. Yeah. So we're landing. Your, your parents are super excited that you're going to Earth. They're getting you ready and like. Yeah, they were like fluffing my hair, you know, like getting it ready. They were like combing it out. I was excited, you know. Getting ready. Yeah. It was like I was getting ready for the prom or something. Like, that's yeah. how it felt. Mm -hmm. Like a big day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a big <clears> day. <throat> and you were super excited about coming to Earth. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So excited. You were like, I'm ready. I knew Let I was going to do it. And I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they, they didn't doubt that you would do it, and you were ready. Mm -hmm. So we called on your uh, light council to talk to them. And this is the really sad part of the story, <laughs> because when we reconnected, I forgot to press record, and this um exchange with the light council was <laughs> so amazing it was like you were you embodied them like you were so animated and just so like on it and just so it, you were hilarious and funny and it was really like having a conversation with my best friend that knows everything you know <laughs> That's what it felt like for me. And I was so sad that I forgot to press record. Um, but my higher self also knew that I needed that, this huge disappointment so that I would never forget it again, right? I, I can't believe that happened all in one session. I know. All of it, like, all of it. All of it, yeah. yeah. It was, um what is that called um like trial by fire <laughs> that's, what, that's by like was. real real fire yeah Legit. yeah so your guy said that you did a jump in 1977 right. and that you were actually supposed to come in in 1977 which is the year i was born um, but you didn't, they had to pull you, not just you, but a group of star seeds out of that jump because the, there was a timeline shift or something happened with the timelines where it wasn't right. It wasn't the right time for you to come in. So they like sucked all the souls back out. That's what they said. It was like a vacuum and they sucked you back out. And then, um, yeah, they aborted the mission because the time wasn't right. Um, there was a time shift in the universe and it was altered. And um, so they sent you back in to Earth in 1983. And there's a partial soul split, like an aspect of you is here on Syria, I mean, here on Earth, and an aspect of you is still there on Syria, right? Oh, yeah, I'm doing part-time work, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, this is when we talked about the virtual reality. Do you remember any of that? Partially. Oh, like, um, them. yes, I, I did, like, a preparation of... Yeah, so when I decided that I was going to come to Earth, there's, like, a bunch of drills or things that you have to do, like, for you to prepare. Because if this was, like, my one life or the only time that I was incarnating in this 3D, you know, with the ego, not knowing what that is, really, like, 
or you know or knowing what it is but not you know you don't know until you know until you're experiencing it right but they wanted us to prepare ourselves so they would put us like in a virtual reality type thing where we would kind of like see like i guess in fast forward motion like people's lives like actual lives uh, through their eyes and feel the emotions that they're feeling through the experiences or the trauma or whatever the, that storyline was and as a form for like a download for us to be able to cope i think they gave us certain like or a spectrum of things to experience so that that was specific or pertinent to the life that we were jumping into mm -hmm. you know for you know the potentials of that life right mm -hmm. and so the life we saw with the man in the beginning that we talked about the farmer that lost his wife and child that wasn't a real life that you lived that was the virtual reality simulation yes like, how cool is that right and it made sense because like i think i do recall like when we were like going through when i reheard the the first half of the session you're asking like do you recognize you right. know your wife and i was like i don't know her like i didn't have any soul recognition like no nothing so she's a stray <laughs> so i didn't know her <laughs> yeah 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 so you actually like observed through the eyes of that man and right. felt what he was feeling and, and fe experienced that sadness and guilt and yeah. and um it was loneliness too which i loneliness well you know, like it was that just feeling so depleted. Heavy. Heavy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so we, we've figured out that that's where those feelings come from. They come from that virtual reality simulation that you experience. Right. Yeah. You prepare me for mine. Yeah. So that I was able, to, well, I don't know if that was really to teach me how to cope, but at least to recognize that heaviness so that I wouldn't. I guess that was a memory for me not to check out. Right. And, you know. and so because you're in such a, a high, um, a high density vibration, like to drop down into a physical 3D body, there is such a wide gap in vibration that you have to be as a star seed prepared for that. So that's why they do these virtual reality simulations. So you ex can experience these emotions because in other places like Sirius, they don't experience the duality that we do here on Earth. They don't have the, the lower uh, vibrational emotions of fear, sadness, and guilt. They don't have that. So you didn't even, that wasn't even something that you were remotely familiar with. That's mm -hmm. why it's so important to experience have those experiences before you come so you're not completely shocked right even you oh, yeah. you did feel some kind of shock <laughs> being here right yeah but yeah those experience um experiences are really important and you've had other like memories of past lives right yeah and i i think more so that i've seen in dreams if anything or jumping mm -hmm. dimensions. I don't know. Like, I, I can't really. I'm not. I'm not sh too sure. Right. Like, past lives or things like that. Like with. Uh, if I were to see like a medium or something. She would talk about past lives. Right. Right. Yeah. We're, and, and in one you were like an Indian chief or something. Yeah. <laughs> Great storyteller. <laughs> Very animated uh, chief. Who just really loved his tribe. Yeah. And you're my wife. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that was part of the virtual reality that she was picking up on, you know? Mm. Yeah. And so they also said that that's why there's um, some, some of the miscarriages that happened are because star seeds drop into. The dense the, body. The body, and they're shocked by the density here. Right. So then they miscarry, and the, the soul goes back and to prepare more for the next time. Right. Um, 
And they said sometimes these memories that you have, the virtual reality memories will come in as like deja vus. And I think that's also part of like the memories that they gave you, right? right. In the ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. And you also, you. Oh, yeah. That was like that deja vu I had at your place. Yeah. The visual one. Like where I saw it exactly, like the whole scene completely drifted. Like you stayed where you were and Munchie was where she was and it, the whole scene just drifted and I, I was not, it wasn't your apartment anymore. It was a completely different right. scene. Right, were you in a log cabin or something? Right. Yeah. Yeah, again, you're like my wife and she she was her daughter. And I felt like a scruffy, like my brother-in-law, Andy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lumberjack. Oh, maybe that was like your. Wasn't I like a lumberjack or something in in your session with Aurora? No. No. Okay. Not in the mushroom house. Yeah, but that was like, that was like back in ancient Egypt. It felt to me. Okay. Um. I don't know. Leave maybe that for another video. <laughs> huh? I'm like, we'll leave that for another video. Yeah. Um, so you also hold the characteristics of those personalities that you experience in, um, in the virtual reality. What character, what, what personality characteristics do you think you held from that man? Guilt. 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 Sadness. Loneliness it was just yeah, loneliness. Yeah, you know, like I, I think what you saw like also in my um, like from the sessions and everything that we've had, like how color has started to come back into my life. You know, like how I can actually see things again. Like, yeah, that was a perfect thing. Like where everything was just so black and white. The only thing that was color was the American flag and that's it you know it was just a pop but apart from that everything was just gray I was like Eeyore <laughs> <laughs> I felt it was just like okay yeah life sucks yeah no color I only started getting color back into my life when I when I woke up when I had my my awakening right slowly you know right and so these memories that they gave you through the virtual reality they um they always knew there was a potential of you not waking up because of the veil of forgetfulness that we have here mm -hmm. um so they did as much as they could to kind of try to give you the best shot right of waking up so they right. gave you all of the everybody gave you the memories at the ceremony and they gave you all these virtual reality simulations to you know help you experience the deja vus and remember the memories and you right. did yeah really? um what else did, i really didn't take a lot of notes because they were like talking so fast and it, i was so engaged with it um yeah you're talking to your best friend i know and I'm just so upset about that still. So. But they the said where they were talking about the events. Yeah. Yeah. They they talked about, you know, that you wanted to try, that you wanted to try this life, that this was your one life and you wanted to do it because you saw how everything was backwards on earth and you just wanted to come and help because it only takes one it only takes one person to turn things around and Wow, I really, I really believed in myself, huh? <laughs> you really believed in yourself. Yeah. Earth is, they said that Earth is the most important at this time in the universe because it's the most asleep and it's causing an imbalance in the universe and holding the whole universe down. That's terrible, isn't it? I believe that. 
Everybody's so low, you know? They said it's like its own black hole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. What a downer. Thanks a lot, negative Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, though. Like, it is. I mean, yeah, Earth is starting to make a shift in the right direction, but I mean, that's why every all of our cosmic brothers and sisters are so interested in earth. It's not because, I mean, yes, it's because they want to help us, but they also have a vested interest in that. Yeah. Well, they want to, they want to see the shit show. <laughs> well, that, and when we, we raise our vibration, they raise their vibration. You know, it's a collective endeavor. So they went on to talk about, the Amazon fires, the hurricanes, the, the shootings. Um, they said that they were funny. They said that they think humans are funny with their mass meditations for Gaia. <laughs> <laughs> because Gaia will heal herself and she'll be absolutely fine. And we need to worry about ourselves. Um and they said that, which we talked about a little in the last video, that the Amazon fires are, <clears throat> because she's she's purging all of that sacred knowledge that she doesn't want the dark to get a hold of, um, and the hurricanes and, you know, the big storms that are happening. It's just really, you know, just, she's purging. She's bringing everything up from the basement, just like we are. You know, when the light comes in, it brings all the darkness up from the basement to be healed. That's what's going on with the Me Too movement and all that stuff in Hollywood and the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. Um, and bringing all of this darkness to light, it all needs to be brought into the light to be healed. And that's part of what Gaia is doing in, you know, and the school, the the shootings in general, <clears throat> they said that um, basically that, you know, you know, we feel as humans, we feel empathy for people that are going through things, whether they're displaced by the fires or killed by the fires or hurricanes or the shootings or whatever catastrophe it is. But we also have to realize that on a soul level, they contracted to do this, to, to be part of this event, to be part of the event, to dedicate their lives to, um, yeah, to the event and to bringing the darkness to light and to helping to uplift the vibration of the earth. Um, that you know, even the animals that are say misplaced from the um the amazon they before they came in that was part of their plan they as a soul they contracted to do that to assist gaia in lifting the vibration um and that it's all part of the event they said you know it's not just one event it's not just going to be this big everyone's waiting for this one event i think like where you know everything's just going to turn black and Three days later, like something's gonna happen, you know, like we're gonna resume back to our lives like nothing happened or we're all gonna right. be ascended. We're all, we're all gonna be in 5D, like overnight automatically. I can't or, that thing. Like <laughs> or that, you know, our star family is gonna come down on their ships and rescue us. Like people really believe that. But we've we've seen over and over that it's not just going to be one event. It's these events are happening all the time with every hurricane, with every fire, with every shooting, with every person oh that comes out and says me too. Every little thing is, is, a, is an event because the event isn't outside of us. We are the event. Like mm -hmm. The event is happening within us and it's our shifting of, uh, of our beliefs and thoughts and patterns. That's, healing yeah, us inner healing and healing the earth right but gaia is doing all this stuff um you know they said she will heal herself but she wants us to wake up like these 
catastrophes are to call attention to what needs to change. Yeah, so she and has to take the measures for us to just finally look at it. Right. And Do you have she's any not gonna have any, you know, like with the fires, the Amazon fires. Yeah, she kept going. She's like, I'm sure she could make herself rain if she wanted to. But she's like, no, we're going to keep going. We're just going to keep going with this. And yeah, she could easily do anything she wants at any, at her, at any will, like anything. Well, this is what she's doing. She's creating it to happen. She could reverse it, <laughs> you know? Right, because she's ascending too, as we're ascending, she's ascending, and vice versa. You know, the microcosm and the macrocosm is as within, so it's out. So, yeah. Um, so we talked about that stuff for a while, but I, I stopped writing things down, and I can't remember the rest of it. Then we went into... Um, we talked about how your mom's heartbeat is the same frequency of Sirius and the piano. That's when we talked about that. And that was the only time, and you could see the colors and, and the vibrant part of those memories from Sirius when you would sit under the piano with her and feel those vibrations. Um, we talked about how our tiredness is a part of the purge for the collective. As empaths, we're holding it and anchoring in the light, big time anchoring in the light. Um, because we've done the healing and holding, we're holding more light. We get to be more tired <laughs> because we're holding the more light. Um, uh, so we talked about Sirius. They said you were in the, from the 12th dimension. Um, and that's why you have the virtual reality set up. Um, and we talked about how the bird isn't necessarily your physical body, but it's how you see yourself. Right. Yeah. Bird, but I was even surprised I even saw myself as a bird. Yeah. Well, it's just it's subconsciously that technically you're a light body. Um, You didn't realize like how dense and distorted it was going to feel until you came into the body and felt that lack of connection and, and, and abandonment. But that's just the ego. Um, and we talked about your relationships and um, stuff like that and how you get shaken up. Um, No, we also just talked about the Black Heart Program, which is um, a negative ET influence. Um, some people actually on Earth don't have souls, but they're being run by these negative ET influences. They're Does just like, no. huh? Does that include AI or no? Yeah. Yeah. It's like an AI program. They're just running on this program. And these are the people like narcissists that they just can't change. They can't change their behavior, their thinking patterns, their belief systems. They just can't change because they're running on that program, that AI program. Right. Just it, it's like autopilot. There's no, yeah. There's no loop. soul in there's it's no like soul in there. No. What? It's, it is like a loop. You know, like it. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Cycles. Yeah. And there's no soul in there. And if there is, it's a very little piece of it left. Like it's just hanging on enough to keep the body alive. You know? That's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any visuals from that? And any stuff with the event or any of that? The event, all I could remember was being out and seeing the earth, like, you know, as if I'm in the universe looking at the earth. 
like flat earth no <laughs> yeah so i'm seeing the earth or whatever but i'm seeing like different things happening like i'm seeing like volcanoes erupting and just like chaos fires happening like just different things so i was looking at that from an outer perspective that that's all happening all at once right yeah but you don't have any other you don't have any details you don't remember what you said no sorry <laughs> so then we talked about this is when we addressed your lock jaw <laughs> your communication <laughs> yeah um they said that it was mostly conditioning from being raised in a quiet household you were told to be quiet and you know stop and you know it's like the children are supposed to be quiet right that kind of thinking yeah yes lots of quiet time yeah because you spent most, most of your days like with your grandmother right yeah we watched soap operas all day that's all we did yeah and she my house is quiet huh and she would make me take a nap and I hated it. Now I'm like, I want to take a nap. <laughs> of course you hated it. <laughs> yeah, I hated it. Because I wanted to go outside. Talk to the bunny next door. On the <laughs> Remember? Yeah, I just wanted to go outside. I felt we like talked in about... prison. Go ahead. Yeah. We talked about um, the mumbling and... You know, a lot of that started because you didn't want to get in trouble. You wanted to be a good girl and just, you know, to get that love and acceptance and attention. So you started suppressing that voice from super early on. Right. So imagine yeah. if people still think I mumble now. Imagine what it sounded like before. Right. Yeah. Um, so we released some of that self-doubt and still courage and confidence to use your voice. Um, oh, oh, this is when we addressed your toughness. You're being tough. That's been addressed for a while now. Yeah. That'll be another video, like, for the rest of it. But, yeah, toughness. It's true. I didn't even realize uh, about the toughness till you told me you're like, you don't have to carry all those bags, you know, into the house. And I was like, I ain't no two trip bitch. Like I'm going to do <laughs> one. I'm going to carry all the bags. I'm going to eat. I have 10 fingers and two arms and I'm going to use them all. <laughs> I'm not going back to the car to go get another, like one little bag, you know, like. Yeah. And well, you, say, you don't have to be tough. You don't have to. And be it made tough. me think, and I'm like, I'm not tough. I'm not tough. Like, I'm not trying to be tough. I'm trying to be practical here. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and then you started to see all the ways that it showed up in your life. Yeah. The I had to be. Yeah, I had to protect myself from being exposed. I couldn't be. I mean, I was already, like, asked to, well, asked, I was told to, to not cry or, like, suppress my emotions, so I had to act tough to protect myself, because any, any emotion, I could have gotten in trouble for it, or made me feel bad for feeling it, or it's not good enough, you know, and they say, stop crying for nothing, it's the worst line. It makes me cringe when I hear people say that, you know, when they cried for nothing, and I'm like, Really? Was it really for nothing? Like, you know, whatever it is to the child at the moment, it's everything. So, yeah, I just, those things, like, really, like, spark remembrances of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it had to be tough. Yeah, and we also, we talked about how your your dad wanting a boy influenced that, too. Yeah. Because then you kind of embodied that 
what you subconsciously knew that your dad wanted. Right. I was the athlete. And well, yeah, I was only good at gym class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just had the you know his tough boy, and I. Yeah, and then I got my period, and then shit went down. Like the relationship changed, or or so my perception of it did. You know, that it may have changed. So, but yeah, I always held that kind of not. I don't know if it was was it resentment. Would you say resentment or rejection? From that. Marriage. Yeah. 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 I would always find different ways to like protect myself, you know, especially with like with my sense of humor and sarcasm. Always like diverting it elsewhere. Or, you know, always making it about me but over exaggerated kind of way. So that we would really like not look at the point. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I still I do that, but I think it's funny. Right. You don't do it necessarily to the extreme that you did it before. In no, that... I do it for the case of just humor now. Right. Because I have it in my mind what it looks like, and I think it's funny. Whereas before, it was really like a two-sided thing. It was just like, I thought it was funny, but also like, don't look at me. Look over there. Or look at the right. exaggerated version of it, so we don't really see or what it really is. Right, where it was that, like, extreme self-deprecation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really putting myself down all the time. Mm -hmm. But that was great after I healed that whole toughness thing. Mm -hmm. Remember we were talking about my bowling? <laughs> and how I had, like, I went from a nine-pound ball. <laughs> the, my, 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 uh, my teammate, an older man. <laughs> Was like, you know, you should get a 14. I was like, yeah. No, 15. 15. 15-pound 15 ball. I went from a 9 to a 15-pound ball. I was, And he's like, you know, you're young. You could throw that. I was like, yeah, you bet I can. <laughs> I played really good. I was so good. I got really good with this 15-pound ball. And then I healed. Like, the, the season ended. I healed myself. I go back for the next season of bowling. I can't carry the ball <laughs> anymore because I'm not tough anymore. I recognize the toughness. I can't carry the ball. I had so many gutter balls because I didn't know how to throw it. It's crazy, that is, right? That's, it's the most hilarious thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> 15 pound ball. I know. I couldn't pick it up. I weighed with just a little it. more than that, you know? Yeah. So that that whole conversation was really amazing that we had with the light council because they tied in so many things with the toughness and your dad wanting the boy and purging the masculine. You're you are purging the masculine for yourself and the collective. That's part of what you're doing. Um, oh, um, yeah, the pain, the masculine pain and toxicity. Um, you know, because the masculine can't cry or have feelings or don't talk about things. They just deal. So you are, in your healing, you're helping the whole masculine collective purge those things. Yes, you're welcome. So thank you. <laughs> Anytime. So thank well, this you. is the one time. I thank you because I personally know a lot of toxic masculinity in my own life. I've that's really all I've known of the masculine is the the toxic side of the masculine. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely appreciate the work you've done in undoing that for yourself and for the collective. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's all I got for that session. Um, yeah. What was your overall, apart from the lessons, and do you think that was the best one you've ever, or were you, you were just happy that everything just tied together and worked so perfectly? It was really, I really loved that one. 
<laughs> even with the fire and the fly. Yeah, it really, um, it was such a great learning experience for me, you know. Mm -hmm. like, well, you did great. I mean, like when we did the playback, it was the most funniest thing ever. <laughs> the funniest. <sighs> I couldn't take it. I was crying, like listening to it. Why? <laughs> because like, like I said, you know, I checked out at the cobblestone and I would get like random images throughout. And yeah, when I, when I did the playback, you're, you know, you're like, okay, you know, you're going to relax more. And then you hear the water going and, you know, like real loud and you're, you're walking and you're putting out a fire and you're coming back in. Like I just mean knowing that you were putting out a fire and me actually being able to hear that happening because when I was in it, I couldn't hear any of that. I wasn't, I didn't hear any of it. That's amazing to me that you didn't hear any of it, but that's I how didn't hear anything. That's, that's how in how... it I was. Like I was so in it. Right. You were really deep. Right. And I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. I could tell you were because I'm like, you didn't seem to be bothered by anything on my end. <laughs> oh because you but really it didn't so hear loud. it but it was so loud when i when we heard the playback yeah yeah like how many times did you fill up that thing of water like a lot well yeah you said you were doing it for like half an hour that's a long time yeah but i didn't hear any of it even like the door opening that i would hear the sliding door yeah so i mean that that was amazing um divine intervention that fly that was incredible i'll never forget that that fly like when you when i asked you what she was watching and you said the fly i was like blown away <laughs> blown away like totally mind blown away <laughs> i never in a million years would have expected that right that mm -hmm. just goes to show you like how things are orchestrated like by our higher selves before they even begin you know mm -hmm. that fly coming in the fact that i was about to kill it and asked you what she was watching and it was the fly and you made me take it outside and there was a fire and i put out the fire and then the phone died because i wasn't prepared enough to take you back and you needed more time to stay in your room and figure out what was going on in that right. scene it was just so perfect like you know, when you tell somebody that was a perfect session, you know, it doesn't sound. Um, you handled it really well. I mean, because I had no idea. Well, I had a lot more confidence in myself after that. Right. <laughs> you know, because I had had so I, had, I was carrying a lot of fear around starting this work and working with people and um, doing online sessions, just unnecessary, irrational fear until that session i'm like well if i can handle this i can handle anything right and if you'll I can never 